Welcome back. To Beyond Networks, the Evolution of Living Systems, and to the second lecture in the third module, which is about process, uh, the process perspective on science and on reality. In this uh, particular lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about process philosophy, what it is, what its history is. It's going to be a very, very quick and superficial overview. I'm trying to give you sort of two uh, impressions. One is why is it useful to think about processes? And the other is what, what, what do I mean by this? What, what do I mean by saying we, how do we, we take a process perspective versus what? So uh, let's dive right in. Uh, and uh, whoops, I'm going to quote, uh, start with this quote by Nicholas Rescher again that I, I showed you at the end of the last lecture, which is about the processual nature of knowledge, how it reflects the fact that our thought about the real things in the world presses outward beyond the limit of any restrictive boundaries. So this idea that science, the quest for scientific knowledge, is an endless journey. I call this open inquiry um, in my creativity and in my philo philosophy courses. And it'll never end. We establish that much. It'll go on and on and on. So what does that mean? If even our knowledge of the world is constantly changing. Let's have a look at the kind of theories we have about the world, what we think the world is like, and try to examine them. And here I want to start with a quote from the most famous process philosopher of all times, Alfred North Whitehead, who was also a brilliant mathematician. And he says something interesting, which is going to motivate our journey here. He says, when you are criticizing the philosophy of an epoch or the science of a time as well, do not chiefly direct your attention to those intellectual positions which its, its exponents feel it necessary explicitly to defend. Those are recognized problems. There will be some fundamental assumptions which adherents of all the variant systems within the epoch unconsciously presuppose. Such assumptions appear so obvious that people do not know that they are assuming because no other way of putting things have ever occurred to them. I think this is a great quote. So if you have a truly new way of thinking about something, it'll probably come from somewhere unexpected because people are not yet talking about it. And often it comes, it's, it's unexpected because it's right under your nose. And this is what actually, this is a personal, this is why I'm excited about um, process thinking. This is a personal um, story and a, a personal experience for me. I think the fact that everything in the world is a process and not a thing is something very fundamental. And I've always thought in these categories, but other people around me didn't. And it took me a very long time to realize that. Actually, un until I was already doing my PhD and, and I was trying to publish papers and the reviewers rejected them, but not because they thought the argument was sloppy or wrong, the evidence was bad, but mostly because they didn't understand the question. This is what drove me into philosophy as a scientist. It was, it was trying to understand why don't they understand even what I'm asking. This was the topic of our last lecture, the unknown. Let's focus on the unknown. And with, with the process perspective, it's quite amazing because it's, it's really right there, okay? Everything changes. Nothing ever stays the same in our life. This is just a fact. You can look at these two beautiful pictures of the Eiffel Tower and see between 1900 and 2017 how much has changed. But we immediately focus on the constant uh, factors uh, in this image, the river, and of course, the tower itself. So change is universal. It's all around us. If we open our eyes, we see it everywhere. But we generally tend to explain the world in terms of static entities, things uh, in normal language. 
And so a philosophy that is based on things as the fundamental ingredients of the world, that's called a substance-based philosophy. And these sort of substance-based explanations that come from substance-based philosophy, they are deeply entrenched in our thinking. In fact, everybody starts out as a common sense substantivist. I'm paraphrasing uh, Geary's uh, quote about how everyone starts out as a common sense realist. Also, we're realists and we're also substantivists. Very early in our development, we start to recognize things. My toy, not your toy. Okay, it's very important to recognize things because you can possess them, okay? You can define them, you can grab them, all right? And this is how our cognitive development is, is going on. Very fundamental, and it's very hard to get out of this mode. I'll give you a very, very concrete example of that about language in just a minute. And there is some really beautiful work by cognitive psychologist George uh, Lakoff uh, about this. Lakoff and Johnson, Metaphors We Live By, uh, another book I highly recommend. Um, they talk about how as you grow up as a child, the world appears as a kind of container to you. It has, it's full of objects, they change location, and they change properties over time. These objects cause things to happen by interacting directly with one another, and prototypically they move each other about by banging into each other. This is a common sense view of the world in a child, okay? So everybody starts out like this across culture, and especially traditions uh, of thinking that, that are not um, substance-based, like in Eastern Asia, um, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, they train this sort of substance thinking away, for example, by meditation. It's a very experiential sort of thing in their case. But we can also handle this transition intellectually if we want to. So the whole world looks like a Russian doll, basically. Objects are containers in turn whose properties are explained by the objects they com contain. So this is the, the old view of physics. And of course, you will recognize this is the view of the clockwork uh, universe. The me mechanic, uh, mechanicist, mechanistic way of looking at the world is firmly substance-based. You want to figure out the parts that make up the world. Because it is natural uh, for us uh, to do this, our language and the relational logic that underlie all our, our reasoning, logical reasoning, are shaped by this doctrine. Set theory is at the bottom of it all. And set theory is nothing, it's just like, uh, you know, containers within containers. And our language and our logic primes us to ask, what is the world made of? Not how it flows. So this is intuitively what we're going to ask first. So it is obvious if we look, if we care to look, it's obvious that everything always changes. Even the most stable things are only processes that are happening at timescales that we can sometimes not even fathom. You know, some, some particles in a standard model uh, of, of, of particle physics have very long lifetimes. So they are not changing uh, in probably the whole lifetime of our species and our planet, but they are ultimately. So, uh, whoops, Alfred North Whitehead calls this the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. That is a great concept, and I want you to, to sort of think about it for a second. It is, he says, the error of mistaking the abstract for the concrete. What we're doing when we look at something, I'm looking at this laptop on which I'm recording my lecture, and it is a thing. I can see where it is. I can see it's not changing much as I record the lecture. But this fact that I've distinguished a laptop from its environment, I've given it purpose, I've given it boundaries, is an act of idealization. It is an act of abstraction. And in reality, what's underlying the laptop, as I'm recording this, are lots of flows of electrons inside that are driving uh, the software that, it, that is recording. 
uh, uh, this talk. And also the laptop will die sooner rather than I hope probably, and, and so on and so forth. So at a different time scale, the laptop is clearly, doesn't have such clearly defined boundaries anymore. So what, what uh, Whitehead is saying, if we treat the world as based on things, objects, substances, what we are doing is we are mistaking the abstract for the concrete, when in fact the concrete is change all the time, everywhere, everything is changing. And this is a brilliant, brilliant sort of uh, concept. We're gonna come back to it in a second. So the solution to this is process philosophy. Nicholas Rescher is also a famous process philosopher. He uh, has written a book called Process Metaphysics, which gives you a, a very dry but very compact uh, introduction to the topic. And he says, process metaphysics as a general line of approach holds that physical existence is at bottom processual, that processes rather than things best represent the phenomena that we encounter in the natural world. Now, the thing is, you have to count how many times I say thing in this talk. We'll come back to the problem of process language in a minute. It's impossible to avoid thing, object-oriented language. But uh, the interesting um, question here is, or aspect of this quote, is that you don't even have to buy into this sort of metaphysical claim that the world is like that. Everything that actually exists is a process and not a thing. You just have to agree for the rest of this lecture, at least, that it may be interesting to adopt this per perspective. So basically, you have to appreciate the epistemological and methodological value of the approach for knowledge generation, so that we could find something new by changing our perspective. So you don't have to buy into my entire metaphysics, the world, everything is a process and everything flows and it's a very sort of dude like, you know, it's very cool, um, uh, this philosophy. But you don't have to buy into that. You only have to sort of be interested in the fact that we could find new um, uh, interesting insights by uh, adopting this perspective. Very, very briefly, an overview over the history of this philosophy. And I, I repeat, this is a minority position in Western philosophy. There are some very famous philosophers that have uh, propagated it, but it's, it's very few. And it starts with Heraclitus. It's called the obscure, the weeping philosopher, probably because nobody understood what he was talking about. And he has this famous quote, uh, Panta Re, everything flows, which is in the title of this module. So for him, the entire world was made of strife, he called it, a struggle between different uh, influences. You have to think about it just like a dialectic process, thesis and antithesis and, and synthesis. Uh, he didn't say that, but, but not war. Often it's translated as, as reality is a constant war. We have already en uh, encountered uh, Leibniz and his monads, and, and these monads are not only sort of little holograms that contain the whole rest of the universe, but they're also processual, and they have a sort of even a basis, a basic cognition, uh, uh, appetition, causes. It's a very weird view of the world, but it's very sort of process-based, and he, of course, Leibniz also is one of the inventors of uh, calculus, um, differential calculus, which will become important for dynamic modeling later on. Bergson, Henri Bergson, has a very bad reputation among biologists because he was a creationist. He believed uh, that there is some sort of uh, elan vital, uh, a vital force that distinguishes living organisms from non-living organisms. At the same time, he had some really interesting uh, and very highly relevant um, ideas about uh, the creative power of evolutionary processes, and we should uh, um, drop our prejudices and read him again. Um, the American pragmatists, nobody, not many people uh, know them nowadays. We, we encountered William James as a, as a sort of, uh, when it was a, about pragmatist truth already. Uh, Peirce and Dewey are two other uh, very interesting philosophers in that school, uh, and their worldview was, was also process-based. And then, as I said, the most famous process philosopher 
of all is probably Alfred North Whitehead around a turn um, in the early 20th century. Uh, and Suzanne Langer will encounter when we talk about process thinking in biology, she was one of the first to apply process thinking to organisms. And there is an, a modern school, uh, a, a very active modern school of process thinkers. We're going to talk about Johanna Seidt. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm going to explicitly talk about John Dupre uh, and uh, Mark Bickert, but uh, what I'm going to tell you about is implicitly based on their philosophy. And I've replaced Whitehead by these three modern process philosophers there because they are a little embarrassed by his obscure writing and all that. So they try to distance themselves. So what you should know is that this is not a school of philosophy. There are different sort of ideas, uh, but they're all based on this basic idea that everything is in the end fundamentally a process. Let me explain that. So Johanna Seidt has a great argument in an article that I really like which is called The Myth of Substance and the Fallacy of Misplaced Concreteness. So the fallacy of misplaced concreteness we have already encountered. And I've told you that, that um, Whitehead was saying that th the things that we perceive in reality are a myth, okay? So she calls that the myth of substance. Substances aren't really real, only processes are real. And the reason for that, her argument that I'm gonna massively oversimplify here is basically that um, processes are more fundamental than things because there are a lot of processes that are not things, but there is no thing that isn't also a process. You have to think about even perceiving the world. That's an interaction, that's a process. If something hasn't got any influence on the rest of the universe, it's not even uh, perceivable. It's impossible to see, it doesn't exist, it's not important. While there are processes, for example, what's happening in this picture, it's snowing. And uh, Johanna Seidt calls this uh, subjectless processes. So there is no one doing the snowing. The objection that I usually get is, okay, the snowflakes are doing the snowing, but is one snowflake falling from the sky snowing? No. Two? No. Three? No. There have to be, it's a collective of activity. So the, so the snowflakes are involved in the activity of snowing. And it's interesting, we can identify snowing. It's not a thing, it's an activity, but we can identify it. It, it is distinct from uh, raining. And it may happen here, but not 50 kilometers further. So we can localize it somewhat, but it's, it's got fuzzy boundaries. We don't, we can't quite say when it starts, when it ends. Um, and also, um, this is important, there is nobody, no subject that's behind the snowing. The weather, you could say, but the weather is just another system uh, made out of collective uh, uh, phenomena where there is no sort of central directing agency behind it. So her argument is if you have these sort of subjectless processes, she has many more, you know, hurricanes, um, thoughts in your brain, whatever. Okay. so so. Uh, unconscious thoughts, right? Or who's directing them? We don't know. So basically, uh, based on that argument, she says, okay, it's, it's you, by, by thinking about process as being fundamental, you can cover more phenomena in the world than by thinking about things. And therefore, uh, this is more fundamental. As I said, you can buy into it or not, but there's a, there's a problem. I said that, you know, substance thinking is so deeply ingrained in us, it's really hard to get out of it. Even if we wanted to do it, there's an argument that was started by uh, Willard van Orman Quine that says it would be absurd. It's absurd. We just can't think like that. There's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful short story, one of my favorite, by my favorite short story writer, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, Argentinian uh, writer, and it's called Blön Ugbar Orbis Tertius. It's a crazy story about a, a fictional uh, universe that sort of seeps into the real world and starts to control it. And in that fictional universe, there is a uh, planet um, called Tlön, and it has a Northern Hemisphere and a Southern Hemisphere, and they have different languages. In the Southern Hemisphere, if I remember properly, um, they don't, in neither of the hemispheres do they use nouns in the language. So in the Southern Hemisphere, they use only adjectives, different, so they describe every thing only by its properties because the properties can constantly change so they have no notion of a thing 
while in the northern hemisphere they only talk about processes okay so if uh, you would say the moon rose above the river here above the river thames in london they would say upward behind the onstreaming it mooned okay and, and borges has a beautiful uh, sort of way of describing this and of course this being borges uh, oops uh, he also has the language of that uh, planet in the story so i'm not going to read this to you but this is um this here is how it sounds in Catalonian uh language okay so this is not what we have to do it's absurd to think we have to change our entire language it would be very clumsy to do this it's indeed the case that our psychological cognitive structures are not adapted to this but once again it's about giving you a perspective here and that is to think or if you you can continue thinking in object terms and substance terms as long as you remember that this is not the real thing underneath there are processes and then if you hit the wall with your with your thing based thinking you know that switching to this process view that's much harder to do may be worth your while okay i'm not saying it's worth your while all the time but i'm going to show you many many examples of problems in science where it's worth your while in my opinion it's one of the main points of this lecture so the biggest problem we've just found out is is to talk about processes it's much harder to to grasp them and so um one of the main fundamental problems of process philosophy and why it's never really caught on with anyone is that it's really really hard even to define what a process is here's nicholas rescher uh um with his attempt at a definition and this is one of the clearer and more concise uh, and concrete definitions that I found in the literature. So I'm going to read this out to you. A process is a coordinated group of changes in the complexion of reality, an organized family of occurrences that are systematically linked to one another, either causally or functionally. I don't even know where to begin. What is a coordinated group of changes? What is the complexion of reality? What do you mean by an organized family of occurrences? Aren't occurrences things? How do you systematically link these together? What, what do you mean by causality? We'll actually have to talk about this quite a bit still. What is function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very heavily loaded definition uh, with a lot of um, ingredients that need to be clarified. But it's hard to do that. So instead of, of, of sort of getting lost in definitions right now, I'm gonna end this talk just by giving you a feeling of how the process perspective uh, changes your view of the world compared to a substance-based um, uh, perspective. So I'm, I'm doing this here in form of a table. Uh, on the left is the process perspective and on the right is the thing perspective. And, and so the difference, one difference is that in a process perspective, you focus on relations, interconnections in a system um, and how that system that you're studying actually connects to other the rest of the world everything is connected while if you have this thing perspective a lot of your focus is on the boundaries of the thing the nice um, thing about things is that you you can define them pretty precisely in space and time but that also takes them out of their context so you lose context much more easily in, a, in an object-based uh, perspective than a process-based perspective the process perspective is continuous it's flowing while the thing perspective is discrete. The focus is on boundaries. There's one thing, then there's another thing. While processes flow into another, uh, interact with each other, they become each other. It's, it's sort of this really cool sort of flowing um, uh, paradigm of the world, uh, very continuous, and therefore also harder uh, uh, to talk and think about. A process perspective sees processes as open to the world while things are bounded, We've been over this. Processes are in this way infinite, right? They don't really start or end. They just go flow into each other while things are, of course, finite. They, they start and they end the practical things, the real things in the world, at least. Um, and because of all this, of course, a process perspective is much more holistic, focused on the whole of the system than reductionist 
okay, so the, the reductionist perspectives, genetic reductionism, mechanistic reductionism, all of that falls very firmly into a thing-based view of the world. To wrap up, um, just one more uh, food for thought, and that's, so if we want to deal with, with processes, we need to be able to, to identify them. It's not as easy as for things, I told you, because the, the boundaries are not clear and they flow into each other and so on and so forth. So how do we identify and characterize? That's the other thing. We need to, um, I said it again, we need to be able to classify, you know, we need to be able to distinguish processes. It's snowing, it's raining, we can do that. But you will see in biology, it's much harder to do that. Say, okay, for, think about development. This is one type of developmental process. This is another type of developmental process, much more difficult to do. While you can say, okay, this organ is an eye, this organ is an, an ear. Organ, the organs are things in our heads. So uh, you can see the problem. So we need to find criteria to, to individuate and characterize processes. There's some beautiful work that my philosophical collaborator, James Frisco, is doing on this right now. So one problem is, it is the problem comes from the fact that it's impossible to delimit exact spatial and temporal boundaries for processes. So we need to consider different criteria, like time scale. You can distinguish metabolic, developmental, and evolutionary processes in biology based on the time scale at which they are happening. Continuity. The life cycle of an organism. An organism is really defined by you at this time being a consequence of you uh, 10 years ago. But I, I would bet that if you look back 10 years ago, you barely recognize the person you were back then. And cohesion, of course. You've never, even when you sleep, you don't fall apart and then come together again. So there's a sort of a cohesive dynamic to your person, uh, of course, that keeps you together. So these are candidate criteria to identify processes. Processes of the same kind share a common structure. What do I mean by a structure of a process? Isn't that a thing? So structure are not, structures in this sense are not things, they're rules that govern how one occurrence, one event follows from another during a process and how this leads to organized change over time. And this was in the definition, uh, in Resch's definition, remember? So we'll, we'll spend a lot of time during this lecture to try and make these sort of words that I'm using here clear. Don't worry if you don't understand this part uh, quite yet. And this all renders processes identifiable, reproducible. You can always recognize when it's snowing as compared when it's raining and classifiable, same. Okay, so this helps us and allows us to work with processes. There is no excuse but there is also no need to completely abandon all the sort of categories that we had, as I said. So you can still use Newtonian mechanics to shoot a space probe to Saturn. You don't need relativity, Einstein's relativity theory for that. You only need relativity theory when you get close to the speed of light. And this is the same here. You rarely need process thinking, but when you hit the wall with your thing-based thinking, that's when you want to switch gears, when you want to, you know, disrupt your frame and jump into this different perspective. This is what we're trying to do. Next lecture, I want to look at science as a process, inquiry as a process, and then we uh, move into biology, a little introduction into how you could use this sort of thinking for biology which will then allow us to move on into the, the next module, which is about system. Sorry for going a bit longer this time, but I think this is a very sort of um, central aspect of what we're gonna think and talk about um, the next two months. So I hope you enjoyed this. As usual, uh, comments, questions are very welcome, and I hope to see you uh, the next time again for a lecture on inquiry, scientific inquiry as process. Bye now.